Okay, so last time that we spoke about the Chochabat, I we explained that in uh, um, in the time that came after the biblical period, when people came back from Babel, they were very strict regarding Shabbat because there were no, or maybe there was, maybe there was an oral tradition that was forgotten because the rabbis mentioned several times that several of the oral traditions were forgotten, including the, they say the letters were forgotten. Uh, the exact form of the letters. They said that there were thousands of halachot that were forgotten and they had to be reinstituted. So it's very probable that that also, even if there were clear uh, definitions of what you can and cannot do on Shabbat, people forgot. And uh, when they came back from Babel, they became more strict because the Babylonians had a different view of what is the day of Shabbat. And I mentioned that in sectarian Judaism, the, the sects that ended up going to the, to the Dead Sea and were eventually destroyed by the Romans during the Great Rebellion, they had such strict measures that they said, if you speak on Shabbat, on things that are not related to Shabbat, you deserve the death penalty, right? Like we said, it's going to be a very, very quiet synagogue uh, after a couple of Shabbats, you know? Hopefully, I mean, there are only one... Only one left because there's no one to talk to, right? Um, so that was that was one uh, uh, that was one reason that the rabbis had to get together and create a list for people, a reference list for people to use, so they could easily know what is allowed, what is not allowed. And there are two ways to look at the list, like we mentioned. Either you look at it that they are very the list is very particular that only this kind of work, and all that could be uh, filed underneath underneath that rubric, or to say that uh, some of them are general concepts, and you don't have necessarily to go into detail uh, into each and every one. So uh, when we go to that, what we call like the, uh, uh, the ancient halakha, and maybe I'll just, you know, before that I'll make a, a, a brief comment. People say, how is it possible to forget the halakha? Right, you can look. I mean, you can look. You can look up a book. What is the tradition? But how many times it happens in a synagogue, in a community, where you ask, "Wait, what do we read today? Like, what do we say now?" And even people who have the sidurim in front of them are not so clear because you have this edition, the other edition. One of the elders remember this: is how we did it in the old country. The other one says, "No, we did it this way in the old country." <clears throat> and sometimes you remember the opposite. Because when you were a kid, they were arguing about it. One guy said right, the other one said left. And they did right, but you remember left. It, it happens that you remember part of the discussion. And we'll see it later when we, when we, when we uh, discuss the way, the methods that the rabbis derived the halakha from the text. There was a famous confrontation between Hillel, Hillel Azaken, who came from Babylonia, and the people from the family of Betera, Bene Betera, who were the presidents of the Sanhedrin. And what was the debate about? Erev Pesach, the 14th of Nisan, fell on Shabbat. And because it was on Shabbat, they weren't sure whether you're allowed to, to do the sacrifice of Pesach on Shabbat or not. Because usually the rule is that a, an individual sacrifice does not override Shabbat. Let's say if I want to bring a Thanksgiving sacrifice, right? I, uh, I was in an accident and I, I, I walked out unscathed and I want to bring a sacrifice to thank God. I can bring it Sunday to Friday, not on Shabbat. A public sacrifice like the Timidim, the constant korbanot that we brought every, every day, every Shabbat, every Yom Tov Musafin, those override Shabbat. Pesach, is in the twilight zone because on one hand it's an individual korban, individual sacrifice which each family has to bring on its own on the other hand it's a public sacrifice because everybody does it at the same time everybody does it on the 14th of Nisan you don't have a choice of which day to do it at <coughs> so the question was now that it's Shabbat do we consider it to be a private sacrifice and we'll have to wait till Sunday to do it? Or is it a public sacrifice? And we can do it on Shabbat. So the answer doesn't really matter. What matters is that they even had a doubt about it. I mean, this is a big issue. This is a national 
concept. Do we do Pesach or Shabbat or not? And they didn't know. They forgot. Because maybe the last time it happened was 20 or 30 years ago. So it shows us that it is not inconceivable to think that daily halachot, even things that have to do with Shabbat, would have been able uh, to be forgotten. So the, the Mishnah right away, uh, introduced a new, a new idea. That was by Rabbi Akiva. That uh, Rabbi Akiva says that he asked Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Eliezer was a representative of the older layer of halacha. And he asked him this question. <coughs> so Rabbi Akiva said, I asked Rabbi Eliezer, what if someone didn't know that a certain type of activity is forbidden on Shabbat? Why? Because we have the distinction between deliberate and mistaken. Shogeg, mezid or shogeg. So there's a, uh, there's a difference between someone who broke Shabbat deliberately, knowing that this is forbidden, and someone who didn't know that a certain thing is forbidden. So they say, what if, for example, someone didn't know that picking fruits on Shabbat is forbidden, that you cut from the tree. You didn't know that this is called kotzer, harvesting. The idea of separating a, uh, an organic uh, thing from its source of, of life, a flower, a fruit, grass, bla- uh, uh, grass blades, etc., he didn't know that it's forbidden. And he did many melachot be'alem ehad. And because of that ignorance, he did many different uh, types of work, but they all are all under one category. For example, he picked up some apples, he harvested wheat, and he harvested grapes on the same Shabbat. So how many transgressions did he make? Rabbi Eliezer said three, right? Because there are, this, uh, there are different types of work. Um, Rabbi Akiva and his, uh, his colleagues disagreed with him. They were the innovators. Rabbi Eliezer was the traditional, he was the, the orthodox. And then the orthodox halakha, traditional halakha, for every type of work you do, you are uh, obligated, you are, you are punishable. <coughs> Rabbi Akiva said, the, Since they are all, could all be uh, described as kotzer, as separating an organic thing from its source of life, they would be all one melacha. Uh, so then uh, we have, for example, Mishnayot, I mean, uh, Mishnaic text, either Mishnah or Tosifta, which say that they, they, they pile things together. For example, they say, Ha-hofer v'ahoresh v'ahoretz melacha ahad. If you dig a pit, or you plow the land in order to plant, or you just make a a, a line in the ground, it's all one melacha, it's all under the category of plowing. Ha-tolesh v'ha-kotzer v'ha-botzer v'ha-mosek v'ha-goder v'ha-ore melacha ha-haten. Whether you pick a fruit or you harvest wheat, grapes, olives, uh, dates, uh, and uh, figs. What's goder? Goder is tmarim. No, no, no. Goder is nikra gidud tmarim. Gidud or gidur tmarim. In Hebrew, you have for each one of them, for each fruit, you have a different uh, verb. Yeah. Katsir for wheat, batsir for grapes, masik for zetim, for olives, uh, gadir or gadid for wood dates, and uh, aria for uh, figs. Yeah. Yeah. So you take, maybe it's from the word uh, bunch, goder or goded, because gdud. In Hebrew, is a, is a troop, so you you take a whole bunch. So like, so, uh, like eshkol is for grape. Right? Yeah, eshkol classes for grape, and also they say azorei azomer anotei mavricha markiv kulal melacha haatein. Whether you you saw seeds or you plant saplings or you mavrich mavrich is a, from the word berech ni is to bend a branch and put it underground so it will grow again as a new vine. This is especially with the vines they do that. Or markiv, which is grafting. You take one, uh, a branch of one tree, and you connect to another branch, and you wrap it in a way that they will uh, grow together. And even 
uh, clipping, even a zomer, when you, when you trim the trees, since you do it for the purpose of growing, you're growing the tree, it's like planting. So the Omer So uh, the in that at that level of discussion, this is what we call the Mishnah, they don't speak yet about categories or subcategories. They say this is all one category, meaning there are nuances of the same work. Uh, and so why, why did they sort them out? To tell you that if one, by mistake, did one and another, you would know whether it's punishable for one or two. Um, so for example, just an example, uh, let's say someone harvested fruit, uh, wheat, Right, he has a uh, he has uh, the uh, uh, with a sickle. He harvests the trees. And then he goes also by uh, he harvested wheat. And then as he walks back home and he sees that some branches grow from the tree that uh, uh, need to be trimmed, and we use the sickle and he cuts those uh, branches away. Right, so because we define one as harvesting. And the other one, as even though we cut off something living, but he did it for the purpose of growing the tree, that would be called planting. Not the actual work, but the purpose. So they would be considered as two different types of work, even though it's the same action. Meanwhile, harvesting wheat and picking up, picking apples, even though one is done with an instrument and the other one is done by hand, will be considered the same one. So it was more done for the, for the purpose of uh, the judicial system to decide how one will be punishable, even though technically they're all forbidden. Um, so why, what made them decide that this one is a category or, or the, uh, the, the, the main category, the other ones are subcategories? So we mentioned this Mishnah, and which refers to uh, an act of praise for God, not not, not related to Shabbat at all. This is in, in Masechet Brachot. We speak about Shimon ben Zoma, when he would go to the temple mount, to the to the temple mount, and there were multitudes of people who came for the holidays. He says, "I thank God for creating all these people to serve me." It sounds like arrogant, right? Like I'm the, but that's part of a philosophy of an ideology of Judaism. When I say that, or Ben Zoma, Rabbi Shimon Ben Zoma says that, he wants everyone else to say that. So it's a system. We all serve each other. He says, I have to thank God. What he says is not, I'm the king of the universe and everyone else serves me. But rather he says, we are members of one organism where each one gives to society what he does best. For example, so you have, a, you have a blacksmith and a carpenter and a teacher and a farmer and a doctor. So each one is specialized on one, uh, one type of work and he offers it to everyone. Instead of a person who has to take care of planting and harvesting his food, building his, uh, uh, his, uh, his house himself, building his furniture, doing his uh, uh, sewing or weaving and everything, and, uh, and killing his, uh, the animals, preparing them, etc., etc. So he says, How Adam Arishon, like the first humans, had to work so hard in order to have one loaf of bread. The 11... Same 11 works that I mentioned on Shabbat. He had to plow, to sow, to harvest, to create heaps of, uh, of wheat, to put it in the threshing ground, to uh, throw it in the, in the wind, to separate the shaft, to filter by hand the stones, to grind, to sift, knead, and bake. Until he had... So all these works are mentioned. Right, you wake up in the morning, you go to Bretsmith or... Uh, or uh, you know, Gold, Goldberg's bagel, wherever you go, to buy your bread. And then you have, you, you got a, lo- a loaf of bread or a bagel. You don't have to do all of them. It says the same thing, How hard the first humans had to work to just get a, a, a shirt or a robe. He had to, The same works 
that are mentioned on Shabbat. Um, so those were pre-existing lists that people were aware of, and that's how they spoke when they spoke about Shabbat. So when they wrote the Mishnah, the rabbi said, okay, let's take those lists, because people are familiar with them. So when they have to think of, what, 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 what can, I, can I not do on Shabbat? Or those things that you usually do in order to prepare bread, in order to prepare a shirt, or you know, to weave a uh, fabric, or to take leather and, uh, and process it. And, uh, and as a result, in the first layer of Halakha, when the rabbis created that, they did not differentiate between avot and toladot, parents and children, but they said those are the categories, and they piled all the other similar uh, nuances of halakha under this category. Okay, we'll stop here.